Thanks for attending today's uh, conference and this session as well. Look forward to hearing some information from District 6 about quick build safety countermeasures. I'm here to introduce our two speakers this morning. Um, let's start with Matthew first. Matthew Anderson is a traffic control specialist at PennDOT and at, at District 6. Matthew has been working in traffic safety with the department since 2013. After graduating from Temple University with a Bachelor of Science in and Community and Regional Planning, Matthew worked in the transportation section of the Chester County Planning Commission. There he developed his GIS skills that will go on to expand the use of GIS at the district. Matthew is also involved in the design, construction, and maintenance of systemic low-cost safety countermeasures and capital safety improvement projects in the greater Philadelphia region. I'd also like to introduce Richard Francisco, who is also a traffic control specialist at District 6. Rich has been working in traffic safety as a specialist since 2008. Rich is a Villanova University graduate with a bachelor's degree in psychology. He obtained his master's degree in transportation engineering from the New Jersey Institute of Technology in 2015. Rich and the traffic safety team oversee the design, construction, and maintenance of systemic low-cost safety countermeasures and capital safety improvement projects throughout the greater Philadelphia region. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Matthew. Hey, Rich. I'm going to start. We'll have Rich start. <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody. I'm going to try this without a microphone, so I hope you all can hear me. Um, as Lou said, uh, my name is Rich Francisco and I am a traffic control specialist with the Department of Transportation in District 6, which, as you may know, is the greater uh, five-county Philadelphia region. Uh, today, my colleague, uh, Matthew Anderson, and I will be presenting information on quick build projects that we can design and construct in a relatively short period of time, but also projects that have a high return in safety in relation to the money spent to construct those projects. So in today's presentation, we will show you how we identify locations, talk about field views and studies, various countermeasures that we have at our disposal based on the types of crashes that we are seeing, the implementation of those countermeasures in one of our safety contracts, um, and how we continue to monitor these locations after they have been constructed. We will also show examples of actual uh, before and after locations where we have implemented uh, some of these countermeasures. And finally, we will allow some time at the end for any questions that you may have. So uh, the first step in our selection process is to decide where we are going to implement these safety countermeasures. Uh, there are a few tools that we rely on to assist in narrowing down the locations uh, to make sure we are getting the best bang for the buck. One of the most reliable sources of information that we utilize is crash data. Uh, we generally focus on uh, five years of crash history and review the clusters to see if there are any hot spots that could benefit from the low cost countermeasures. It should be noted uh, that the department only has access um, to reportable crashes in our system. And in case uh, you guys aren't aware, a reportable crash is any crash that involves either a, a towed vehicle and or an injury. All other crashes um, are considered non-reportable and they stay at the municipal level. There's also a new method uh, that the department is starting to embrace and that is based on uh, systemic improvements. Uh, now systemic improvements are focused on areas with uh, similar characteristics and they don't rely exclusively on crash history. We can implement countermeasures based on the attributes of the roadway and improve the safety with specific countermeasures based on those traits. This is a, a much more proactive approach as it targets areas that could potentially be a cause for concern. Further, we always listen to the residents as well. Uh, the people that drive the roads every day have more IRL experience uh, since they are first-hand witnesses to what is happening. Uh, I just want to say that will probably be my last use of air quotes, but I can't uh, make any promises. So uh, moving on, if a resident has a concern, we can review the location 
and choose the best countermeasure based on the information that is being conveyed to us by the residents. Even if the, the crash history uh, doesn't show any evidence of a safety concern, our constituents can alert us of issues that we may not have been aware of. Uh, the same can be said about municipal or county requests, as well as our legislative affairs. More often than not, it is the residents uh, that reach out to their municipalities or elected officials um, when they have a safety concern. The more information that we have from the people that live in the area, the better decisions that we can make to help uh, set their minds at ease. So uh, historical crash data has always been a reliable source to determine uh, what crash patterns are occurring at any specific location. Um, as I said, we can review the last five years of crash history to see what are the predominant types of crashes. You may see a, a trend in collision types such as um, angle or run off the road or pedestrian or wrong way crashes. Um, there could be a, a pattern of driver related errors uh, such as running stop sign, proceeding without clearance, uh, speeding or making careless turns. Additionally, there may be uh, certain road conditions that are causing drivers to lose control, such as wet or snow covered roads. So based on the trends that we are observing, we can implement specific countermeasures that will target and help mitigate those crashes. In our crash data analysis process, uh, we can create a crash plot which will allow us to see exactly what issues we are facing. Um, as an example, if we see a high number of head-on crashes where a vehicle, for whatever reason, crosses over the, the double yellow line and strikes another vehicle traveling in the opposite direction, we can install centerline rumble strips to alert drivers of the impending danger. Now, I like to use centerline rumble strips as an example uh, because it is a relatively inexpensive countermeasure that can be installed with a high cost-benefit ratio. According to various studies, the crash modification factor or CMF for centerline rumble strips can reduce head-on crashes by almost 50%. Now, although my colleagues and I do conduct field views, uh, most of the legwork is carried out by our consultants. So while on location, our engineering consultants will take pictures or, or video of existing conditions for documentation purposes, uh, measure the road and the lane widths, and perform any specific studies that may be appropriate. As an example, a ball bank study helps us determine if an advisory speed needs to be posted uh, for a curve or a turn. And another example is a site distance study, which helps us identify locations that may be hindered by objects such as trees, fences, or even the natural grade of the roadway. I do believe Matthew will elaborate on that a little bit more later in the presentation. So based on their findings, our engineers will then incorporate the best countermeasures into a signing and pavement marking plan that we will put into a safety contract. So now the example that I, I mentioned before uh, gives you a good idea of how we use crash data to choose the best countermeasures uh, based on current conditions. As I said, if we notice a lot of head-on crashes, the best countermeasure to mitigate those crashes would be to install centerline rumble strips. Another example that we like to mention is high friction surface treatment, or HFST. HFST is an epoxy aggregate that addresses vehicles that are running off the road, especially in wet conditions or around sharp curves. As the name implies, HFST increases the friction of the road and therefore helps to keep the vehicle's uh, tires in contact with the roadway. Now, although HFST is an expensive product, um, the return on the investment is extremely high. Uh, we see a drastic reduction in runoff road crashes after uh, its installation. In fact, there was a recent study uh, done by Penn State University, and they said that HFST can reduce fatal and serious injury crashes in curves uh, by nearly 50%, as well as fatal and injury crashes at intersection at intersections, excuse me, by up to 76%. Uh, so right now, um, the department is really trying to focus on uh, four specific crash types. They are vulnerable road user crashes, or VRU, and just to clarify, the state of Pennsylvania uh, defines a vulnerable road user as a bicyclist or a pedestrian, while uh, the Federal Highway Administration also includes motorcycles in that definition. 
Uh, we are also focusing on intersection crashes, lane departure and runoff road crashes, as well as wrong way crashes. You might be aware um, that wrong way crashes can be extremely severe, if not fatal. Uh, we have specific countermeasures uh, to address these different scenarios. And sometimes the, the crash types and countermeasures can overlap. Uh, for example, you may see a high number of pedestrian related crashes at an intersection. Uh, so in this situation, we can utilize uh, two strategies to tackle this issue. Uh, we can alert motorists um, of an intersection with advanced warning signs, and we can install uh, the continental crosswalks or the piano keys as we like to call them um, at the intersection to highlight exactly where the pedestrians should be crossing the street. Um, so just as an example, um, you, can see, you can see on the slide uh, behind me, uh, this is the standard treatment for uh, wrong way crashes as suggested by the Federal Highway Administration. So we can install um, wrong way, do not enter, and one way signs, as well as the, the painted uh, wrong way arrow on the road um, to let the drivers know that they should not be driving down the street. The department uh, has really been impressed with our on our previous on-demand contracts. So um, although it may not be the best uh, method for municipalities, we do feel it is very important to mention. Our on-demand contracts are bid with an identified list of locations provided to us by central office. However, um, it is scalable to modify uh, the list based on district priorities. Before we put the contract out to bid, we have an idea of the types of items that we want to use. These items generally consist of signs, paint, and delineators. Uh, and we can target specific types of crashes based on their application. We use previously awarded contracts and price history to formulate an estimate of how much we think we will need to address a certain amount of locations. Right now, uh, the department has uh, two on-demand contracts. One is for lane departure crashes, and the other is for vulnerable road user crashes. And we anticipate two more um, on, on-demand contracts coming out, and they would be to address uh, wrong way crashes as well as intersection-related crashes. So um, the department really wants to assist uh, the municipalities any way we can. And therefore, we have even done some work on local roads uh, with the permission of the, the borough or the township, of course. Um, we will gladly install countermeasures on local roads at no cost to the municipality, provided they agree to maintain uh, those countermeasures in the future. So let's say there is a stop controlled intersection where uh, a state road intersects with a, a local road and there's a history of angle crashes at this location. Uh, not only will we alert drivers uh, with signs or painted legends on the state road that there is an upcoming intersection, uh, but we will also take measures to alert motorists driving on the local road that there is an approaching stop condition, again, using cost-effective uh, signs and paint. Uh, so on this slide, uh, you can see that I have included the intersection warning treatment typical um, as suggested by FHWA. Uh, in this case, the through road would be the state-owned portion and the stop-controlled uh, leg would be the, the local road. Uh, what you are not seeing in this typical is the use of painted legends uh, that I had mentioned. You may have even seen them around uh, Delaware County or the district um, where uh, we will paint the word slow along with um, an, an intersection warning legend on the road, which basically replicates the, the warning sign. Uh, and in addition, we will paint the words stop ahead on the local road where the stop ahead signs are located. I also just wanted to mention uh, that there is funding available through grants, which is allocated through the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission. So it may be worthwhile to research what types of funding are available to help assist in financing some of these projects. Towards the beginning of the presentation, uh, I did mention that we wanted to get the best bang for the buck. So in order to make sure these countermeasures are operating as intended, it is important to see if the crashes are being um, reduced uh, after the safety improvements are, are implemented. And again, we can use uh, crash history to make sure there is a downward trend 
and the types of crashes that we are targeting. And we usually check uh, the data in one, three, and five year increments if available. It is also important to make sure that these improvements are being properly maintained. So if the roadway is being repaved, we will inform the contractor that these improvements need to be replaced in kind. And so with that, I will now pass the baton off to Matthew, who will give some examples of our quick build projects that we have done in the past. Matthew? Morning, everyone. Uh, I apologize in advance. I'm probably going to repeat a couple of things that Rich said, and I'll probably end up repeating myself a couple of times as a lot of the things that we're going to be seeing here are useful in different situations. So, uh, moving on to our first example here. I think this is a great project to start with. Um, a lot of you probably have areas like this in your communities. High density, mixed use, walkable, uh, maybe a transit route or two. Um, this is great because uh, communities are continuing to encourage uh, bicycling and pedestrian activity through new sidewalks, ADA ramp upgrades, and bike lanes. And even the department, in its revision of its design manual, has uh, got a little bit more of a multimodal focus, uh, particularly to the VRU, the vulnerable road user that Richard mentioned. Um, going forward, I'll also refer to PennDOT as the department, as Richard said. Um, the other good thing about this project is that uh, DBRPC had studied the Morton SEPTA station area as part of its Safe Routes to Transit uh, initiative. And I think it's really important to collaborate with Delaware County Planning Department, Delaware County TMA, DBRPC, to help identify priorities in your communities and come up with some county measures for future implementation. So the study focused on uh, pedestrian safety at five intersections in Morton Borough, uh, near the intersection of 420 and Morton Man. What makes this area interesting is that... I'll just use the laptop. Um, what makes this area interesting is it also includes a rail line, and the intersection of Yale Ave comes in at a skew less than 150 feet from 420 and Morton. So the recommendations from the study were broken into two tiers. Uh, tier one recommendations included the short term, low cost, uh, quicker to implement countermeasures. And then tier two were the higher cost changes to the physical layout of the roadway, which would require some additional design, including uh, subsurface utilities and things like that. So the most common low cost countermeasures for pedestrian safety are pedestrian signing and the upgraded continental crosswalks. Pedestrian warning signs, uh, which you see on the left here, include the head plaque. This is uh, placed in advance of the crosswalk. And then at the crosswalk, you have the pedestrian warning signs with the downward diagonal arrow pointing at the crossing. Um, I want to note that the fluorescent yellow green, aha, there it is. The fluorescent yellow green uh, reflective sheeting is reserved for pedestrian and school related signing. Any plaques or reflective strips on the post should match in color. How did you do that, Rich? <laughs> I got click on it first. It's my first presentation. So. <laughs> Uh, here's another uh, pedestrian related sign. It's uh, turning vehicles yield to pedestrians. Uh, this is a regulatory sign and it's installed um, where uh, generally where traffic is able to turn on red at the same time that pedestrians are crossing. Uh, this can also be used where turns on red are prohibited. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble with my notes here. Oh, to scroll down through the notes. Sorry. Moving on to crosswalks, Richard mentioned the continental crosswalks, which you see in the bottom picture here. Uh, those are generally installed with just the 24-inch paint. Uh, you can the six-inch 
paint on the outside is optional, but could provide some extra visibility in your higher volume intersections. Uh, all the crosswalks in the project area were at intersections. However, crosswalks may also exist mid-block. Mid-block crossings on the state roads would require approval as we want to, uh, from the department, as we want to encourage the pedestrians to use the intersections. Uh, another simple countermeasure that we can implement with paint is uh, lane narrowing. Uh, so typically we do not install paint in areas where there's curb. However, we're seeing more of that as uh, edge lines are used for traffic calming. Uh, previously on the left here, there was about 30 feet of wide open asphalt with the center line. Um, maintaining two 11 foot lanes and the parking, we were able to install the edge lines. The edge lines uh, provide more of a constrictive feeling, which uh, tends to lead drivers to slow down a little bit. Uh, with an, the addition of uh, 10 more feet of pavement, we would have been able to install bike lanes on Morton. Uh, here's an example on Lansdowne Avenue, where uh, as part of uh, one of our projects, uh, we shifted the center line and were able to install bike lanes uh, on either side of the roadway. The department is uh, actively reviewing resurfacing projects for opportunities to continue to install bike lanes. Um, DVRPC also has a resurfacing uh, program that they're going to be discussing in session four after the break. So I would uh, highly recommend uh, checking that out as well. Okay, so raise your hand if you know what the definition of a door is. All right, not bad. So according to the PennDOT foreman. A sign foreman manual, a gore is a longitudinal point where a physical barrier or the lack of a paved surface inhibits road users from crossing from ramp or channelized turn lane or channelized entering lane to an adjacent through lane or vice versa, whatever that means. So, gore, G-O-R-E. So what we're referring to, you see in the bottom picture here, this area that's striped out with the 24 inch paint, we're able to quickly implement that uh, with the paint and delineators. Um, first, the gore prevents vehicles from parking in some of those uh, couple of spaces. We had to work with the borough on that one. But what it does is it improves sight distance for the drivers coming from the side road and the pedestrians in the crosswalk so that they can see each other better. Mm -hmm. um, this area could uh, eventually be further uh, improved with permanent solution like curbing and some additional sidewalk. Um, maybe you can put some vegetation in there, just as long as you don't block site distance again. So peak hour volumes in the borough are pretty high as people are uh, trying to get over to 420 and up to Baltimore Pike or down to McDade. Uh, you also have the addition of uh, commuters entering and exiting the parking lots near the train station. So we installed a couple of these uh, do not block the box treatments, um, the signing and pavement markings. This is helpful because it discourages motorists from stopping in the middle of the intersection, which again improves sight distance for pedestrians crossing the crosswalk and also allows uh, motorists to continue some of their turning movements, uh, which will help reduce some of the congestion. But, uh, you know, congestion uh, could be traffic calming as well. So, uh, Lane separator curb. Um, so in this particular instance, uh, we wanted to widen the crosswalk and align it better. I'm not sure if you can quite see here, but it kind of comes in on one angle and goes out on another. Uh, so the island there was made up of some curbing, which we could remove and quickly replace with the lane separator curve, allowing us to then enhance the, uh, the crosswalk there. Uh, the Lane separator curb comes in three foot sections and we use it often to help direct motorists uh, through the approach of uh, at intersections or as uh, barriers between lanes. Uh, this example uh, doesn't have the delineators, but what I wanted to point out here in relation to the uh, intersection approaches was here we simply used paint to try and uh, square up the intersection uh, it's 
we, we do that so that as you're at the intersection, it's easier to look right and left than it is to, you know, train look over your shoulder. So um, we try to implement these where we can, and sometimes they'll include the lane separator curve. Um, at this location, we had uh, concern regarding uh, motorists using the uh, opposite lane to try and race up to the traffic light. So we installed these uh, standard uh, delineator posts, which you see on the left. Uh, this is about half of what was left. Uh, they ran all the way down, but most of them got knocked out. So we recently upgraded these with the lane separator curb, and uh, this is out on 320 near the Springfield Mall. Yes. Uh, so, so as requests come in, that's the first part of our uh, process is we look at the existing crash data to see if there's a safety issue that can be addressed with safety countermeasures. Sometimes there's other uh, concerns that might be related to things outside of safety and we will you know, pass that on to the appropriate uh, section in the district. But when concerns come to the safety, the safety section, there should be some sort of uh, documented crash history for us to be able to justify spending money on some of these countermeasures. Um, what we're trying to do here today is show you some of the things that we do that are uh, quick and inexpensive, relatively inexpensive, uh, compared to like a larger capital project. So, uh, so. Oh, is it still five years project? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they the they look at the, the most available five years. It'll wait five years from now. Ah, thank you. <laughs> um, before I get into, yes. Don't you use violation data for this as well? Uh, because there's a minimum small one case that was more of a violation problem. So, uh, Generally, we're we're looking at the reportable crashes, but we do work with the municipalities to find out what their, like Rich was saying, their firsthand knowledge of the situation is, so that we can, you know, address it with the appropriate countermeasures. Uh, I personally haven't looked at uh, violation data as far as like uh, citations, uh, but we do uh, review non-reportable crashes in addition to the reportable crashes. That helps. Um, before I get into the typical intersection safety countermeasures, I just wanted to touch on the site distance study. This is form M950S, um, which is used as part of our highway occupancy permit process. Um, this shows you the different uh, measurements that need to be taken and how they should be taken. And then a table that shows what the uh, site distance measurements should be. And this is a clear line of sight from 10 feet back from the edge of travel to an oncoming vehicle. So in this example, uh, might be hard to see, but <clears throat> for 45, it should, you should be able to see 383 feet. If you're only getting 275 feet, that's enough to meet a 35 mile per hour advisory. So that's what we would post in that 45 mile per hour uh, zone. Uh, when we find site distance is obstructed by something outside of the department right away, as Richard mentioned, uh, vegetation or fences, uh, we'll reach out to the municipality um, so that you can contact the residents and have that uh, addressed. Um, legislation allows for municipalities to assess a fine uh, for not removing the obstruction, so you might want to check to make sure you have that in your ordinances as a form of enforcement. Intersection warning signs, uh, similar to the typical that Rich was showing earlier, we see at the top, we have a single intersection warning sign, crossroad sign. We still continue to have crashes out there. So typically what we can do is we can either enlarge them or double them up. Um, we also add street name plaques, which kind of help with driver confusion when uh, trying to navigate the roadway. Um, on stop controlled approaches, stop signs may be enlarged or doubled up. 
Um, two-way and all-way plaques can be added as well. In the top picture, uh, you can see the red circle there. That's a left-hand stop sign. We installed that because the uh, roadway geometry prohibited the view of the right side stop sign until you know you were pretty much in the intersection. So the left hand stop sign here is uh, supplemental. And in addition, we added the stop ahead signs because of that restricted sight line to the, to the stop signs. Uh, pavement markings, uh, Richard mentioned some earlier, that supplement our uh, stop controlled approaches. Here at the intersection, uh, first thing I wanna point out is the stop line. This should be your first uh, countermeasure to install. It's very typical. Generally, it's 10 feet from the edge of travel. Uh, they could be as close as four feet from the edge of travel, which would help to improve sight distance for the drivers coming in on the side roads. I mentioned the edge of travel a couple times there. I want to point out the uh, dotted extensions. So standard practice, uh, we stop paint at intersections. The dotted extensions uh, were originally used through curves with intersections, as you can imagine trying to navigate a curve with no paint because the intersections there might be tricky, particularly at night. So we use this uh, treatment to delineate the direction that the road is going. Uh, and we've also found that they're beneficial at intersections because after stopping at the stop line, motorists can then proceed a little bit further to try and improve their sight distance. Uh, this intersection also has the stop legend and stop ahead legends at the stop ahead sign. So real quick, I'm gonna mention ball bank studies. Uh, ball bank studies were historically done with this uh, curved tube uh, ball bank indicator. Uh, now we have electronic devices, which you can mount in your vehicle that will continuously record the data. And believe me, this is much easier than trying to maintain a speed, watch the road, and read the meter. So I highly recommend getting one of those if you're going to be doing those things. Uh, PennDOT Pub 46, the traffic engineering manual, provides additional details on performing ball bank studies. Uh, curve warning signs, similar to intersection warning signs, can be enlarged or double up. Here we see a, a curve sign with an advisory and a turn sign with an advisory. Uh, if there is an intersection involved with this, you would use uh, the lowest advisory identified either by the site distance study or the ball bank. Um, depending upon the posted speed or the advisory, uh, you may use a curve sign or a turn sign. So the curve signs are generally for 35 miles per hour and up, and the turn sign is for 30, more, 30 miles per hour or less. Um, I really like the, the turn sign for those lower speeds because I feel like that sharp 90 degree angle really emphasizes the need to slow down as you approach the, the turn. By adding a leg to the curve sign, we can also indicate the presence of an intersection. There are all sorts of uh, fun signs to choose from like the right curve left side road sign or the left curve diverging minor right side road sign or how about the right curve converging minor left side road sign? You get the point, right? Uh, there are also signs for two curves, which are separated by a tangent of 600 feet or less. Uh, these are reverse curve or reverse turn signs you see on the left. Uh, the winding road sign on the right is used for more than two curves. Uh, if multiple curves are represented by the sign, you wanna choose the advisory, the lowest advisory speed from all the curves. Two other signs I want to mention real quick are the large single arrow and chevrons. Um, based on the latest MUTCD, large arrows may be used in place of or to supplement delineators or chevron signs. Uh, section 2C.06, for anybody who's taking notes, uh, talks about the device selection for horizontal alignment. Um, if there's advisory speeds posted on the curve warning signs, we'll also add them to these signs. Typically, the large single arrow is double posted. So we'll put the advisory on the post closest to the roadway. Uh, chevrons, which generally uh, have a minimum of three, uh, we would put them on every other uh, as a reminder through the curve of the advisory speed. What you see here is typical for like uh, the third, fourth, and fifth signs in this, this curve. 
Uh, I just want to show this chart real quick uh, to point out that Chevron and delineation spacing can vary based on the geometry of the roadway. Uh, this table also came from Pub 46. All right, I may be getting short on time here, uh, so I'll try to move a little quicker. Uh, if you have 10 foot lanes in each direction, you can install edge line. The MUTCD states that one of the warrants for edge line includes roads that are 20 feet or more in width and have an average daily traffic volume of 6,000 vehicles per day. Um, earlier, I had mentioned how we got extensions through curves. And here we have a couple of uh, pavement marking legends. Uh, the one on the left is the standard advanced curve warning marking modified with the advisory speed. Um, and then a lot of times with the winding roads, we'll use uh, slow curves ahead. You can do legends. Uh, with three lines of text, uh, the spacing and uh, lettering size is pretty standard. Uh, so delineation, whether it's uh, mounted on the road surface, like we saw earlier with the yellow delineators on uh, Morton and at intersections, we have uh, white delineator posts matching the edge line here. Um, I would say, uh, we, oh yeah, so also again, the spacing on these is dependent upon the geometry of the curve. So there's other improvement projects that are more corridor wide. We talked about intersections, we talked about curve, now we're talking about some longer stretches of roadway. Um, here we have Burlington Road, a long stretch of straight roadway through a neighborhood with lots of intersections and pedestrian activities. Um, parking is allowed on the west side of the road there. And here we used a 24 inch paint to uh, restrict parking near the intersection. Again, uh, to maintain that sight distance that was needed for the posted speed limit. Uh, we also had installed 25 mile per hour legends at the uh, speed limit signs um, and upgraded the crosswalks. So uh, with the crosswalks and the, any speed limit legends, 35 miles per hour or less, uh, those would be municipal responsibility, similar to the speed limit signs. Um, and while these uh, legends may help to reduce uh, speeds, it's also, uh, it can't be solved with engineering alone. So we ask for your guys' help through enforcement and education in your communities to try and uh, address speeding concerns. Uh, the portable dynamic speed displays are very common, if you've seen those. Generally, they're on the speed limit signs and they show the uh, speeds of the approaching vehicles. Those can be rotated throughout your township or needed as, or used as needed. Um, if you have any four, four lane cross sections in your municipality and you're seeing a lot of angle crashes, left turns, there's a way that we can kind of separate these movements through the use of a road diet. So this is considered a typical road diet. We had two lanes in each direction before we Reduce that to one. That gives us room to put the two-way left turn lane in, separating those left turns from the through traffic. And again, if you have space here, um, you might be able to implement a bike lane. So road diet is in quotes here because it's not typical, but the principle is still the same. Um, existing lane configuration, you have two in each direction, two lanes in each direction. We're gonna erase all that and we're going to reduce it down to one lane and we're going to be able to then add in some turn lanes for the intersections with the ramps of i-95 so this project was done as an interim improvement uh, while we're working through the design process of a larger corridor-wide project uh, i like this example because we can show the progression uh, in this situation where we had concerns regarding vehicles turning left out of Thornton Road, which is intersecting U.S. Route 1. Uh, are there any local roads designated as U.S. routes in your community? Okay. So if you have any roads that are intersecting, intersecting U.S. routes, uh, let us know. We can work with you on this stuff. Uh, so for this situation, we use the lane separator curb, again, to restrict movements. And then uh, a couple of years later, we had a capital maintenance project come through and we were able to install the permanent uh, concrete medium. Here's a location a little further north on US-1 at Schoolhouse Road. The municipality came to us about this 
uh, intersection and their concern. And uh, they actually implemented these uh, this lane separator curve. And I like how on the left you can see they also channelize the right turns coming out of schoolhouse with it. So that was a good one. And then uh, this example in Montgomery County, uh, 232 and Byberry Road, uh, there's this spur road. So Byberry is actually off the screen here to the north. And then there, there's a spur road to get down to um, 232. Uh, there was concerns because uh, a lot of people were trying to uh, run through the gap without enough clearance to make that left turn at the southern intersection there, uh, bypassing the signal to the north, which makes sense, right? But there's also this other sec intersection um, just beyond that, which uh, provided the same uh, route. So what we did with the southern one there, again, just paint signs and pavement markings is we converted it to a one way out. Um, you can see in this reason, we have uh, a wrong way arrow here, which Rich had mentioned earlier. And then you see doubled up do not enter signs uh, for one ways. We've got the red reflective strips on the post, delineators, stop bar, dot extensions. And then on the right, we even added the uh, no left turn and the root marker directing everybody uh, to the right. I think the only thing that uh, we could add here in the future would be maybe some uh, delinear posts with red reflectors on the back, um, similar to uh, what we're doing with expressway ramps. Uh, the use of red reflective materials is very limited. Uh, like many countermeasures, we don't want the drivers to become complacent to some of these things. And so uh, we want motors to be alerted when they see red on the road. So these are pretty much limited to wrong way uh, or uh, reflective strips for stop, yield, do not enter, wrong way, so. Uh, there's also raised pavement markers, the red reflect, the reflectors in the roadway that haven't been installed here, but those also have red on the back. So, Using crash data, you can identify hotspots in your community. Municipalities and residents have firsthand knowledge of concerns, as Richard mentioned. Signs, pavement markings, and delineation are low-cost countermeasures that can be implemented quickly, while a longer-term project is, if needed, can be coordinated. Uh, make sure I get all this. Other great resources include the department's local technical assistance program, or LTAP, uh, the manual for uniform traffic control devices, MUTCD, was recently updated last December, so there's new stuff in there. Uh, PennDOT Pub 236 shows sign details and justifications. Pub 111 shows standards for traffic control devices. And I mentioned Pub 46 uh, a couple times there. And I just wanted to say that... Uh, all right, I'm not invited back again. I get it, that's fine. Uh, but yes, please continue to reach out to your planning partners uh, to help identify these areas of concern and develop some project ideas so that as opportunities come up, we can help uh, implement those. So, thank you. Uh, so yeah, questions? Do we have time for questions? Yeah. So, uh, so for for some of these, uh, some of them are fairly recent, like uh, the road diet that we did and the Chichester stuff. Some of them have been around a little bit longer. Uh, we continually uh, monitor that one, three, and five year uh, after data um, throughout the year. So um, we're always going back and reevaluating them. Um, the effectiveness of the countermeasures have also been documented in reports. Rich mentioned CMFs, crash modification factors. If you check out the uh, CMF Clearinghouse, it's a, it's a website that it shows each of these countermeasures and how they've been able to reduce the number of crashes by type um, through various studies. So nationwide, people have done different things. They study it and then they submit for this CMF Clearinghouse. Yes. 
Uh, same thing. Uh, they're basically used, uh, yeah, to kind of show that um, change in roadway. Um, we like the uh, the smaller ones uh, that we were showing there. Um, it's a product called Davidson FG three hundred. We try to use that most often because they're uh, you want to look at the their ability to take more hits at higher speeds as well. So um, we don't usually do anything with those big, huge ones that you see in some places. Suggest uh, as a municipality, you could reach out to Rich. He oversees traffic safety in Delaware County. 
um, and then we can take a look at it and see if there's anything that we might be able to add to the project. Sure, they're trying to contact me. <laughs> 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 so, how long uh, from the municipality to the So a lot of what we're uh, showing today were just like uh, signs and paint, which were pretty inexpensive. I think when you get to a larger capital project like that, there's still going to be the design process that we would need to go through and things like that. Well, so SM4A has a specific city money for who will demonstrate the project. Okay. So uh, if you're not going to be able to do that, then you can do that. Is this like a grant program for like tens of thousands as opposed to like hundred or million dollar projects? Like I'm not I'm not no, familiar with it, but that is hundred thousand. Okay. So like you could you know yeah. I mean they want community engagement, they want all of that, but we did want uh, we already got a few for grant to stay for I, I'm uh, I'm not familiar with it, but I'm interested in it. So I will give you my card, and we can definitely talk about that more. I, unfortunately, I'm not prepared to answer your question no, on that today. Right. right. I mean, if we're we're not against the municipalities going out and finding funding to implement things that they want on state roads, we want to work with you on those things as much as we can. You know, we appreciate you going out. I don't know if there's anybody here from Morton in the room, but I heard they were also going out for uh, grant funding to finish some of those tier two improvements. So yeah, we absolutely appreciate that and we'll be willing to work with you. Anyone else? I hope this is helpful and informative. Thank you very much.